Contemplative uh, vein. I've been in this meditative state, um, and God has just kind of really been dealing with me about about me and about um, you know the future, about the people that I'm assigned to. And I was looking at something, and I'm going to be just a few minutes. This is one of those kind. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, we see a record of Moses. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off or take off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest his holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. <clears throat> when I look at this, um, you know, this is, this is where Moses really started his um, ascent into the face of God um, and thereby having this unique and intimate communion with God so as to hear God accurately. And, and I think we learn some things from this, if you can just stick with me for about five or 10 minutes. I think we learn some things from, from Moses' experience. The first thing we learn, check this out, pay attention to this. When you start dealing with people who are prophetically accurate, and now please understand when I, when I say that, when I use that phraseology, prophetically accurate, I'm not talking about somebody that... Um, uh, can necessarily tell you what your driver's license number is or tell you what your address is. Uh, that doesn't necessarily imply prophetic accuracy. That could be witchcraft. That could be uh, any number of these other kinds of uh, arts or whatever they call that stuff. It's demonic in nature in a lot of instances. Of course, God can give a man or woman that kind of insight, but that does not always speak of prophetic accuracy. Prophetic accuracy is not about, it's not for the entertainment of man. It's not to mesmerize people with one's ability to know things that he or she should not or could not have known. Prophetic accuracy is being sensitive to the exact voice of God and God's will for the moment. You know, okay, let me give you let me give you a real real example where we can see the lack of prophetic accuracy in many of our churches on a weekly basis in the flow of worship. Why is it that our worship services go, you know, up and down and down and down and up and then down and down? It's because the people leading the worship are not prophetically accurate. They're not really hearing the word of the Lord for the moment. If we were prophetically accurate, it would mean that we would be in step with God from moment to moment. But there's some things that have to be in place. See, there are a lot of people who want to hold the title. I don't know why people are so um, inspired to want to hold the title of I am the prophet. Just because you're prophetic does not mean you're a prophet. And really, when you understand what that entails, you would not even desire, 
you 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 don't you, you wouldn't even desire that people who are genuine prophets that's a call to suffering that's a call to seeing and knowing things that you'd rather not see and not know that's a call to having the responsibility to address things that's going to make you unpopular that's not that's no that you know we we throw these titles around so ignorantly and so foolishly because we lack spiritual understanding. All of y'all are not prophets. Everybody's not a prophet. And quite frankly, you're not in all cases, but to be honest with you, most of the, the most authentic prophets I know don't even call themselves that. You meet them, they call themselves by their first name. They'll shake your hand and they'll say, I'm so-and-so. And they blend into the crowd. And, and their anointing, the mantle speaks for them. They don't have to give you a card with prophet, bishop, rabbi, doctor, MD, DV, I, D, V, and all this kind of stuff on it. They just, I'm Bob, I'm Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm Craig, I'm Jane. But they're prophetically accurate. There are a lot of you who are claiming to be prophetic, but you're not prophetic enough to even discern hurting people that are in your presence from day to day. You want to you wanna prophesy about what's going to happen with, you know, China, and you, you're not prophetic enough to discern that you just had lunch with somebody that's ready to commit suicide. We got to bring balance to this and we got to stop making the Lord's work out of a joke. And we got to stop using the, using the platform of the kingdom to push our own agendas because, you know, maybe we weren't hugged enough when we were children and now we're just seeking attention. I didn't mean to go on that rant, but, you know, it just bothers me because I see so many people in the body of Christ who are sincerely, genuinely seeking God. And then they come to church and we allow people up in leadership who have gone through no vetting process at all to, to throw all these titles out in, in our congregations and they've not been proven. They've not been proven. And we, you know, all right. Let me come back to my thing, man. First thing I see here, Moses, he was number one, attracted to the supernatural. He saw this bush burning and it was not, it was not consumed. So it attracted him. That's the first revelation you get to, to be, to draw closer to the voice of God. You must, you must have an attraction to the supernatural. Now, watch this. See, there are many of us that are on here tonight who go to churches that are religious. And now, the thing you got to understand about a religious church, and when I use that term religious, I mean it's a church that is driven by man-made rules and rituals and traditions and it's the, you know, the, the, the basis, the engine of the church is not the word of God or the spirit of God. It's what the, the board of this says. And, you know, it's the rules that the deacons make or the rules that the so-and-so makes. It's not driven by the word of God. It's not driven by the spirit of God. And it's only concerned with keeping our rules. So when you're in a religious church, there is, you cannot have an attraction to the supernatural because the supernatural things of God always destroys religion. So religion hates the supernatural. Religion hates the spiritual. So for a lot of you to sit, be sitting up here tonight, this time of morning, listening to a dude like me, it may be the beginnings of a crisis in your life. Because once you develop an attraction to the supernatural things of God, you're not going to be quite satisfied going to a dead religious church that has the A and B selection, a short talk, 
and, and the mother so-and-so going to get up and uh, do the testimony. Then we're going to have another A and B selection from the Sunbeam Choir. And then Deacon so-and-so is going to do offering number one. And then we're going to have another A and B selection. You know, oh, my God. It makes my head hurt just thinking about it. But when you are drawn to the supernatural, when you have an attraction to things supernatural, and see, some of you, Periscope has messed you up because you've been exposed now. See, you, 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 you previously were kind of, you know, locked into your little environment. But now you're on this Periscope thing and you're getting exposed to people that are really bringing you into places you, you never even knew existed. And so you're going to church and every week is getting harder and harder for you to go and sit in this situation but relative to being attracted to the supernatural, I will say this. You cannot attract to your life what you do not respect. Glad to see Pastor D on here tonight too. Dr. Sonia. You cannot despise something and... Um, receive it at the same time or have it manifest in your life at the same time if you despise spiritual if you desire despise soup the supernatural things of god you will never see that manifestation in your life a lot of you are broke because you despise wealth you preach sermons about how people should be broke and you know and all this kind of stuff and jesus was broke you, you you preach sermons and you, you, you rail on rich people. That's why you never have wealthy people come to your church. That's why you don't have enough money to fulfill your vision. And that's why you're always sitting around getting jealous of people who have folk dr drop a million dollars in their ministry. You will never attract what you despise. You need to write that down somewhere. You will never attract what you despise. If you despise the prophetic, if you, if you despise the supernatural move of God, you will never have that in your life. There are things, watch this, I'm 51 years old. There were things I didn't understand 25 years ago that now I understand. But one thing my father always taught me, when you don't understand what God is doing in somebody else's life, don't put your mouth on them. Just do what God told you to do and shut up and mind your business. In another season of your life, you will grow to understand it. And now there are things that there were things that I didn't understand then, but I didn't put myself in a position of despising it. And now I understand the value of those things and I'm mature enough to walk in those things. So I'm in position to receive those things. You must first be attracted to things supernatural. You got to start looking for more, man, than just a hoop and a holler. And black folks, let me tell you. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you. We got to do more, bae, than, than, you know, put me in the key of C. That stuff, that's from the 60s y'all still dealing with, man. Put me in B flat. Man, come on. Come on now. It's all right to do that. Celebrate. I love it. I I appreciate it. But y'all just hollering and singing all these songs. No power. No word. And then you want these people to sit here when they're being exposed. Okay. Uh, you got to be attracted to things supernatural. Number two, the second thing I see in Moses' experience is that not only was he attracted to it, but he took time, he took the time to investigate something he couldn't explain. Um, rather than just, you know, walk off from it and say, man, that, that's not making any sense. He took time to investigate something he could not explain. He could not explain why that bush was on fire. That bush was on fire, but it wasn't burning. He didn't just write it off. He took time to investigate it. He went, he got close to it. There are things that you may not understand about God, but as you grow and as God makes you more sensitive to his voice, as God begins to speak with you as a, as a man speaks to his friend face to face, you're going to have to you're going to have to investigate you're going to have to come to a place where you 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 seek out and where you 
what's the term I'm looking for? Um, where, where you just comb through the things of God and and you 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 search deep calling for deep. If you look in Genesis 32, 24 through 26, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. When, when you really desire the things of God and you don't understand certain things, some things you got to wrestle with. Some things, there's some things, man, that you got to wrestle with. And right now I'm in a season in my life where I am really seeking God for a deeper, um, a deeper anointing. Um, it's late. I'm, my mind is not working the best right now. I need, I need, I need a greater manifestation of the tangible anointing of God. And so there's some things now that um, I've seen my father, who's in heaven now, walk in. There's dimensions of power that I've seen him walk in. And so now I'm in pursuit of understanding. And then thirdly, when he got there, he grew close and this bush was burning, but it wasn't burning up. So he investigated it, though he didn't understand it. He investigated it. And in his investigation, God started talking to him. He had, he had an encounter, his first real encounter with the voice of God. God says to him, Take off those shoes you have on. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Number one, we said he was attracted to the supernatural. There was something about the supernatural that attracted him. Number two, he once he got there, he didn't understand certain things, but he took time to investigate it. And then thirdly, watch this, as he investigated and went deeper, God spoke to him and God's words to him were take off the shoes you have on for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Symbolic of what? He removed everything that stood between he and God. When you really desire, when you really desire the voice of God, You will remove everything that stands between you and God. I'm done. Accuracy is important to the prophet's ministry. Reading from some notes. Accuracy is defined as the quality or state of being correct or precise. There are things that can hinder and block accuracy, such as prejudices, misconceptions, doctrinal obsessions, sectarian views, bitterness, rejection, and lust. Prophets and prophetic people need to be careful that we guard our hearts against things that can block our prophetic flow and the accuracy of the word of the Lord. You got to remove everything that stands between you and God. So now let me ask you before I let you go tonight. What's standing between you and God? What is it that is, what is it that is, that you need to take, that you need to remove that you might really know the voice of God in an intimate and personal way. For me, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll tell you what some of my stuff was, some of my things were, and 
what some of my things are that I know yet need to be removed. Obviously, in the past, you know, I had to, I had to really turn my back on a fleshly lifestyle, just too fleshly. Currently, some of the things that have to be removed from me that would hinder me from hearing God's voice are things like, you know, self-dependency, wanting to be in control and wanting to manage everything. Not trusting, you know, wanting, 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 wanting an explanation for every, every uh, order that God might give me. I'm in that I'm in that mode. I'm in this mode now. So I apologize for you know bringing y'all into my process, but I'm just in this mode now where I'm 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 determined that I'm going to go deeper. And I'm not talking about this fluff, you know. I'm not talking about this fluff, this church fluff that we function in where you know we create the emotional surge and and we throw out a few cliches and we act like we, 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 we are there. We ain't there, man. I want the real thing. I want to know God's voice. I want to hear God's voice. I want to be accurate when I move out on what I call the voice of God. I need God. Let me tell you something before I let you go. I need God. I need to hear God because too many people. See, okay, here it is. Here it is, y'all. This is why prophetic accuracy is so important. You can preach to, you know, 20 people without a microphone. You might be able to preach to 100 people if you have a strong enough voice, without, if you have a strong enough voice, without a microphone. You probably can't do it outside if you have good acoustics and you have a strong enough voice. But you get past 100 people, 150, 200 people, you need a microphone. You get to 1,000 people, you absolutely got to have a microphone. All the microphone does is it allows the voice. And the, the better the microphone. See, I used to buy, when I was first starting ministry, everything was cheap. I was trying to find the cheapest thing I could get, not understanding that when you buy the cheapest stuff, it ends up being the most expensive because you got to buy a new one every two or three weeks. You could go down and just buy the right stuff and it'll last for 10 years. But I used to have cheap mics and man, those mics would just be rattling and the stuff coming loose on the inside of them and it's distorted and everything. Then I got hip to buying good mics. The quality of the mic determines how well and how far the voice projects. I need prophetic accuracy because I am like you are, like we are, the microphones of God. And there are people out there who will not hear what God is saying unless the microphone is accurate. I don't know if y'all got that. If the microphone is bad, I don't care, man. How can you go to a concert with 15,000 people and have one of the cheapest seats and still hear everything everybody else hears? It's because the microphone is good. You and I are the microphones. And when we allow sin to rest in our lives and all this other kind of stuff, what we are doing is we are depriving people who would otherwise hear God's voice for themselves through our lives. When your life is shabby, you're like a bad mic. The man is preaching, but you can't make it out because there's so much distortion. So that's my little... But I love y'all. 
And I tell you what, I just feel God. I feel God. And I'm, I'm just, I'm intentionally pressing in harder. I want to be, I want to be more prayerful. I want to be more prayerful. And let me say this to you. There are a lot of you that are succeeding. Your visions are manifesting before your eyes in the world. Don't get so caught up in all of that that you forget your prayer life. It's our prayer lives that will sustain us. Gifting can bring us there, but your prayer life will keep you there. So I love y'all. And y'all should be asleep, man. It's ridiculous. I'm thinking I'm going to get on there and got me 25 people. Y'all, all oh, y'all up here. What y'all doing? What are y'all doing up this time of morning? What are y'all doing up this time of morning? Pastor D, you talking about get some rest, but you always up. Go to sleep. Praying, yeah. I believe it, man. Let me tell you. God is calling us to a higher place. God is calling us to a higher place. Talking and listening to God. On the 11 on the West Coast, that's true. Yes, preachers, men and women of God are normally up late. So I love you all. And I just, you know, I just had that in my spirit. Man. Good night. I stay woke, can't sleep, getting a deep understanding. Amen. I love y'all. I just wanted to drop that in your spirit this morning. God bless you.